Welcome, welcome everybody. Uh, good afternoon from Mexico City. My name is Luis Antonio Marquez. I am uh, head of the full-time MBA, the director of the full-time MBA and uh, of the Center for Innovation and Corporate Entrepreneurship here in Mexico City. And I'm very excited to welcome you to this uh, webinar called Preparing Startups for the Day After. I would think that uh, in, a, in, a, in a way, in a second, I thought it was I was writing a, a script for a sci-fi movie, right? Incredible what's going on here in our world. So today we have two great, great rock stars from the entrepreneurship ecosystem around the world. Uh, Daphna Kariv is with us. Uh, she has an ample, ample experience on the startup, on the startup industry and uh, on the entrepreneurship ecosystem. She will, I, I would uh, thank you very much, uh, Daphna, for being here. And also Rogelio Los Santos, who are, are our guests for this panel. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, we have several questions, but first I would like uh, for the panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, Daphna, welcome again. Thank you very much for opening your agenda for this webinar. We are very excited to participate in this uh, 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 webinar. Thank you so much. And please, could you introduce yourself and tell us what do you do? Well, thank you very much. I'm really excited as well and really thrilled to be with all of you here. Um, yeah, it's a very chaotic, very hectic time. So usually we would like to interact face to face, but this is the situation and this is, uh, this is how we handle it. So um, I would like to thank you, first of all, for the opportunity. And I would like to thank the uh, Israeli embassy in Mexico uh, for this opportunity as well and for coordination and for leading everything. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, so I'm a professor in entrepreneurship and innovation. I'm teaching in Israel and I'm an affiliate professor in uh, AGC Montreal as well. Uh, I'm the former vice president for global initiatives and development. And now I am the uh, chair of the department of entrepreneurship and innovation in the business school. Seven years ago, I've established an incubator, uh, which turned to be very successful. Um, then we added an accelerator as well. And now we were in the midst of starting an open innovation platform as well. So we will see when we come back to normal, probably this will be the first mission. So Great. this is well, who I am. I'm, I'm, I'm quite engaged in research. So I wrote five books with WordPledge in New York and I uh, conducted lots of research in entrepreneurship, innovation. I'm mentoring students, I'm mentoring startups. This is my passion. Wow, where are you right now? So I'm here in Israel uh, in my daughter's room uh, because it's a quiet one uh, here in the, in the house. It's night already here. Um, and as I said, I'm very excited to be here with you. Well, thank you so much for the invitation and it's a great honor to have you here. So let's start with, with uh, questions uh, with you. Uh, so that it's very interesting because Israel is like known, a uh, very known regarding uh, entrepreneurship activity in the ecosystem, the startup nation. I think now we are post startup nation, but regarding startups, it, is it too soon to tell what has been the impact for startups or, or uh, do you think we, we can talk about who are the winners or who are the losers? What's your, in, your take on this topic? So, um, yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, there is a lot of debate around it uh, among researchers and practitioners, uh, startups, accelerator founders, and so forth. Uh, and we see, we do see the impact, we do see some changes, we do see the winners and the losers, at least temporarily. For example, there are some sectors that are uh, lost their relevance overnight. Uh, so you can see some uh, sectors like restaurants, like uh, sports, uh, sh like musical shows and so forth. So uh, everything is closed, right? We are locked down. We are, we are both, all of us in quarantine, so we cannot uh, use their services. So this, this emerged overnight. Then we have on the other side, some sectors and startups in, I would say, in the more popular uh, sectors, but also that have uh, emerged overnight. So uh, they were not used to be so popular. For example, deliveries. 
for example, uh, as we do now, the virtual communication, uh, virtual education, uh, anything that is, is, has been remoted. So um, I hear from many startups in, uh, in our portfolio, in, in our incubator, uh, complaining about not having a robust platform to hold everything, even though they are very popular now. So they started as a delivery uh, startup, uh, something that is really very simple. And now they are, they, there are so many expectations out from them, uh, but they, they cannot hold it. I also heard from one of our startups that is working on the medical sector. And they told us that uh, they have so many uh, expectations, including shortening the span of time for the R&D, which is really uh, very problematic in the medical sector. So we see this as well. We also see a third uh, sector. I mean, um, it's, not a se it's not a specific sector, but this is a dynamic that is very interesting. We see new startups, new inventions, and even a new vibe of uh, doing something, creating something. And we figured out that we see it in, in several segments. For example, some of them are really targeting the first tier, as we call the, the tier for uh, finding a vaccine or a medication for the virus. So this is something I would say expected, understandable. But we find many startups evolving in the next tiers, in the second and third tiers. These are tiers that um, uh, provide solutions for uh, challenges that are related to the crisis, but are not specific directed to the crisis. For example, as I said before, deliveries, education, uh, and verification, and so forth. But the most interesting thing is the third tier. The third tier is those people, I mean, actually all of us, we are spending lots of time uh, close to our computers and in the internet. And we became early adapters. Uh, we were not like this because we had so others, we were busy with some other uh, assignments and, uh, and things that we were uh, doing. But now um, we are more curious in what's happening in the internet, in what's happening in the digital activities. So there is uh, another trend of startups trying to evolve in the areas of AI, of machine learning, of IoT, of uh, robotics, of quality of the design and, and uh, of G, G5 and many other trends that are specifically uh, evolving and emerging because of the crisis and because we are so, um, um, I would say, um, addicted now to, uh, to the computers and to the internet. Uh, and then we see, unfortunately, some uh, startups that need to cease their activities. Uh, they don't have uh, deals anymore. Uh, they don't have, I mean, they, they suffer from liquidity difficulties. They can't find investing the sources uh, and receive this as well. Again, it depends not specifically on the sector, but sometimes on the robustness of the startup, of the founders, of the team, of the ecosystem. So these are some insights that we have already uh, about the changes and the impact of the coronavirus on the uh, startup ecosystem. From your experience, were you surprised with a certain industry that you did not expect that was going to arise from, from, from this uh, pandemia? Or were you surprised of an industry that fell because of the pandemia? Or, or more or less you expect expected those startups that were in certain sectors that will thrive and others will slow down? Were, were you surprised or in, in, in a specific sector or uh, you, you thought you, you saw it coming? Yeah, we were all surprised from some, uh, I would say, some dynamics and we were all expecting some other dynamics. And I will explain. Um, startups, uh, they are used to be in crisis. I mean, this is the flow of startups. They are born into crisis. Uh, we usually Im imagine uh, their, their flow as a roller coaster, we say. Uh, they have the good times, they have the bad times, 
So um, we, yeah, we expected those uh, um, dynamics of several sectors to be uh, more affluent now and more uh, dynamic and energetic now, not necessarily because of the sector, but because startups are equipped with those agility and flexibility and they could survive it. So uh, this is one aspect. Wow, and how about, what do you tell, what do you tell your investors if you're a startup and, and you cannot pivot and simply you, this pandemic hits you very much. What do you tell your investors? What, 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 do, what do you tell your investors? What do, what, what do you tell them? So uh, it's, thank you very much for the question. I think it's an amazing question for both of us uh, because I could, uh, hi, hello, uh, Rogelio, because I could uh, maybe um, describe the entrepreneurial side and maybe Rogelio could uh, express the uh, investor side. So in a nutshell, uh, usually what I tell my startups to do, uh, and we see it already from the research, we have some emerging research, budding research that is starting to uh, develop uh, specifically for this uh, crisis. So what we do is we tell them, um, we try to um, list the strategies, uh, the strategies for the day after. So this is uh, the reason that is it is so, so important to start working on the day after now, not looking for uh, to go back to normal and then to restart everything uh, in order to um, sustain or, or even create your uh, competitive advantage. It is very, very important to start everything now, which means to list what you have, to list what you don't have and you need to get some uh, support, even not financial support. You can barter, you can have some mentors, you can merge with people, you can share platforms. You have many alternatives, not necessarily looking for an investment. You need to be a bit modest now. Um, but if you prepare the, the, the scope of the things that you need, it will be much, much easier afterwards to uh, um, make it happen, to implement uh, your, your dreams that had to be on hold at the moment now. So, uh, Rogelio, it's very interesting to, uh, to hear your, uh, your okay. view and actually uh, to Thank introduce you, yourself. <laughs> I think that a, a, obviously uh, from the perspective of the investors, they want to see that all of the companies that a fund is, invests in uh, become uh, successful. Uh, but not all of them uh, end up uh, reaching the goals or the, the objectives that they uh, originally uh, wanted to achieve. And uh, a circumstance uh, or a black swan event like uh, the COVID-19 really puts a lot of additional stress uh, on, uh, not only on startups, I would say on the entire economy. And we have seen that very clearly in every country. And uh, my my recommendation is that we should uh, basically portray the message to our investors that we have we are doing and or we have done everything that was in our power to help that company thrive if for some reason the company doesn't uh, uh, is not a, uh, capable of uh, following or continuing because uh, they ran out of cash or they could not raise another round they could not pivot uh, uh, adequately. Well, that is, uh, uh, that is a circumstance that we have to live with. And that's why investors also invest in a portfolio of companies, no? where they, they want to see that at the end, they, they're diversifying the risk. And uh, uh, it's interesting, but uh, in our portfolios, we have seen companies that are doing better than before. And we're seeing others that are very challenged uh, because of the circumstances. Uh, and it all depends on which sector you are uh, in, in and what is the business model that you were doing. But one clear thing is that right now, this uh, COVID has acted as an acceleration of, uh, of a, a adoption of uh, technology and digitalization. And uh, the, the companies uh, that take advantage of the startups that take advantage of that, will become the next uh, uh, Google's, Apple's uh, of the future, no? We'll see them in the next 20, 30 years. 
So, so great, Rogelio. So I have a question for you uh, regarding the black swan. Uh, how do you prepare startups? How do you prepare entrepreneurs uh, for the impact uh, or, to, or, or to handle the impact of the highly improbable? What are the traits of the new entrepreneur if, if there are new traits? What do you think, what, what are you going to tell now your investors because you represent investors, but also you are in the middle with entrepreneur, right? And you were an entrepreneur or are an entrepreneur. From your perspective, how do you prepare students, entrepreneurs, a, a businessmen for the highly improbable? What new traits do you think people have to have? Well, let's, let's be clear. This is a Schumpeterian effect. No, it's a creative destruction. Uh, this is this <coughs> basically what uh, COVID has done is that people, all of the cards are on the table, the cards are open, and, and rule, the rules that were uh, in place before don't apply. Now the rules have changed, and they're basically being configured as we speak. And it's very impossible to predict the future. Uh, or that new reality that we're going to go into. Uh, but we have to be very diligent in observing signals or a, a, of change that start em to emerge and start creating hypotheses of what is going to happen in the future. In our opinion, what we have done is a, a put a lot of attention of the basic on, a, relationships that one has with oneself, with others, with work, with your surroundings, with institutions, with consumption, and, and all of that changes. But uh, this morning I was in a conversation, very interesting conversation, but we said, well, uh, which are the companies that will thrive, that are on the top of the list? And, and, and th there has been a big change where uh, the, the first objective that we had and that we were all basing our premises was that we were basically using Moore's Law as the, the driver of uh, evolution, no? that every 18 months, the uh, capacity of uh, processing will be, processing power will be duplicated or doubled. Then we went into the Metcalf law, that is uh, the networking effect, and how that networking has created a, an infinite uh, possibilities for exponential growth. And today we were discussing uh, with uh, a professor from MIT uh, that today the name of the game is speed and the uh, speed uh, to act, the speed to react, the speed to, to move ahead. And uh, basically the ones that create capabilities that put them in an anti-fragile uh, circumstance or capacity are the ones that will be able to adapt and respond better to those new circumstances. So uh, you have to move quicker, you have to move uh, and see opportunities before everyone else. And in the end, you have to uh, basically reinforce your core capabilities to, to be able to play in this new scenario. No? And companies uh, to really prepare for the day after, they have to understand that uh, what they have been doing might, but probably, or more, most uh, uh, potentially, might not work in the future. They <laughs> like the rules. What do you think, Daphna? You come from a, a, a very interesting ecosystem, right? I've been several times to Israel, and one of the things that really summarizes a little bit the, the entrepreneurship culture in Israel is the resilience, right? That you, you are always expecting because you, you, you have several enemies around you and that entrepreneurs are always looking to to survive, to be resilient. Even this term Kutzpa, right? The, the Kutzpa uh, energy that the Israeli uh, entrepreneur has. Do you think it's, it's the culture, it's the person, or it's the ecosystem that really will push, as Rogelio says, the speed, the observation skills? What do you think it is? What, what is your experience regarding that? Yeah, it's a very uh, interesting question. Uh, there is a balance between both of them. If I may uh, add to, um, to, to the prior uh, question, so I think that the entrepreneur of the future, of the, of the day after, would need to be uh, above those characteristics that I completely agree with, Rogelio, uh, would be agility, 
uh, they have to, they will have to be very agile, uh, and um, which which has to do with the speed as well, but also with adaptability to be a more adaptive uh, um, to 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 to, uh, to dynamic situations. Uh, and uh, in terms of the ecosystem uh, or the networking, would be uh, with demand to. Um, create ecosystems, so there is a dependency between people. And this leads actually to the, to the question that you have just raised. Uh, Israelis are, um, yeah, well, they are surrounded by uh, enemies or many difficulties around, uh, uh, not only political, but we have many of them. But yeah, most, uh, most of all, uh, it's, it's a country of immigration. We have many ethnic groups here, uh, many accents, many languages, even though Hebrew is the main language, but still you see cultural differences, many tensions, uh, tensions inside the country and outside the, the country. So it's a culture that is really used to be, uh, as I said, very agile, very flexible, nothing is uh, structured, nothing is uh, formal, uh, you, 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 uh, Israelis are even find it very difficult to uh, to keep the social distance. You know, we need a social distance now, uh, so it's very difficult because we are people that hug each other and embrace each other and so forth. And you see the reflection of those characteristics uh, in the entrepreneurial ecosystem and in the entrepreneurial vibe in Israel. So yes, I completely agree that the context. Um, allocation culture is very very important. It shapes uh, the entrepreneurship. For example, I give you a, 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 a very interesting example. One of our startups uh, started with a container um, that transforms um, humidity to water. And the idea was of this container. It's a plastic container, and the idea was to keep the hygiene of uh, kids in uh, in India. So, uh, and then he added a smart device that measures the, the dose of the soap and water, and he had a, a startup. Now, um, he decided, and you can see here the agility, the pivoting, the, the dynamic. He said, uh, well, we all know that in order to prevent uh, the infection, you need to wash your hands, right? So he took this device and he, um, I mean, he designed it differently, you know, as we say. And now he's uh, really full of uh, deals and businesses because um, he is selling it to, uh, to to many places, to shops, to restaurants, to to public places, so everybody can wash their hands. So you see how exploiting opportunities, being a bit chutzpah, as you say, it's chutzpah. I mean, you have a container for, come on. Uh, but yes, uh, it's a reaching out. It's it's um, it's something that the culture is very predominant here. Uh, but of course, you need to to have this characteristic as a personality. But I completely um, agree that the context, the culture, and of course the governmental support as well is very important because it pushes entrepreneurs into uh, daring. Uh, so. They give money, they give support, um, and actually there is another thing that is very important. Uh, Israelis are not uh, hesitant in, in trying even if they fail. I mean, uh, it might be even, um, well, be, uh, it, it could be um, an advantage uh, for, for my resume if I'm writing that I was an entrepreneur and I failed. It could be an advantage because for others that would like to recruit me, they would say, oh, she has the characteristics. She has the experience. So uh, it pushes Israelis to dare to do things, even if they fail. So they come back and they try again. This is the reason that we see many serial entrepreneurs in Israel. And I'm sure that uh, when we get to the day after, we will see more and more entrepreneurs that have failed now and will restart again. Do, do you think, Rogelio, taking this, thank, thank you, Daphna, taking this uh, uh, 
trait of the Israeli uh, ecosystem and, and, and of the culture, taking it and, and projecting it to, to Mexico and Latin America, do you think that uh, we, we will have to rely more on the ecosystem or the personality of our entrepreneurs will have this push that, this daring and um, push that, and, and speed, as you, you mentioned, and agility that right now is needed to, to, to thrive or to survive in this new day after. What do you think about that? Uh, I think that we have great entrepreneurs in Israel and we have great entrepreneurs in Mexico and in all of Latin America. I can bet you on that. Uh, talent is uh, distributed evenly around the world. What uh, maybe uh, gives an additional edge or, or advantage to, to a group of people in a culture is that they might have some additional training or understanding or additional build additional capabilities that are important for them to, to work on, the, on, on a, the development of a product or a solution using technology. And what I have learned uh, from visiting Israel uh, is that uh, uh, both uh, women and men go through a very uh, intense uh, training program that helps them uh, and builds them a lot of character and, uh, and resilience. And, uh, uh, and that prepares them even before they go to college. So, and, and at the end, the responsibilities that they, they take uh, to that training, they, they keep them through the rest of their lives. So that is commitment and that is uh, a, really a process that we, I wish we could replicate in other countries, including Mexico. Now, definitely the environment as I see it is that there's always an intangible wealth in an ecosystem. And that intangible wealth is present because of the different values uh, and the different tools that an entrepreneur has around him that makes him more or less productive. But there is an ecosystem in Silicon Valley different from the one in Austin, different from the one in Monterey, different from the one in Oaxaca. But there is an ecosystem, okay? Now, I think that what really builds is that, and this is something that we have always promoted in all of our initiatives, including Inc. Monterey, our entrepreneurship festival, is that basically business happens at the speed of trust. And uh, this was said by Kobe. And, and, and tr trust becomes basically the... Uh, what permits the, the, the system to interact. And when you add on top of trust, core values like uh, abundance of helping, instead of being individualistic, being more collective, that you want to help others, or the uh, idea of uh, really uh, infusing uh, exponential thinking and, and ideas of how to, to really uh, increase the, the impact that you can create. It takes you the same amount of time to build a, 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 a startup that can impact uh, 10 people than one that can impact a billion people. Maybe the skills are different, no? But at the end, again, what I think it's core to this is that uh, we need to be hopeful that the future is always gonna be better because of us and our engagement with uh, our reality. And in another way is, that change, that we have to embrace, embrace change as a constant. And that uh, to our benefit, and that's why I'm so excited about these accelerators, is that today change was maybe caused uh, uh, four or six months ago by COVID. Today we're seeing change in the US because of all of these manifestations. God knows what will happen next month or in two months from now. And we have to be attentive to it. And that is what is really allowing us to free ourselves from the hierarchical world that we have lived in into a more distributed world and more cooperative environment. Sorry, I know you have to live in a couple of, of, of minutes, Rogelio. Thank you for your time. Um, regarding, and, and, and this is a question that uh, from, from the participants is coming from, do you think, where, where, is the coming, where is the money coming from now for startups? Where are they going to raise money? Is it the usual suspects or that will change also? Uh, I would think that the, the capital has been uh, built 
in capitalism has to be invested. Uh, uh, I think that people are trying to understand what's happening and, 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 uh, and imagine that day after or that new normal that we're all talking about. Capital will, uh, and those commitments uh, to funds uh, will have to be deployed, but, uh, but we have to be more intelligent about how to deploy that capital in those circumstances. Now, definitely uh, there has to be a learning process of the uh, uh, angel investor networks, the seed funds and the venture funds out there. And maybe uh, we will end up uh, in the future uh, favoring companies that do not burn too much cash, like uh, uh, WeWork or, or even uh, uh, other right hailing uh, companies, no? And, and we have to be profitable and we have to really provide value, but maybe do not uh, uh, focus only on growth, but also on sustainable growth that we can live with something like, like this uh, that we will encounter, believe me, we will encounter another disruption, but we have to be prepared to navigate around it. And, and who, should be, who should be taking the leading, the, the leading role, for example, in Mexico? Should it be the government? Should it be the private sector? Who should be taking the, the lead and in what? My opinion has always been that uh, it's good to have governments uh, at the table so that they, uh, they can brag about what's happening. But really who makes this happen is uh, the entrepreneurs and the innovators. Those are the two leading uh, forces, uh, entrepreneurship capacity and innovation capacity. And, and in that model, uh, basically what you need is access to capital or to other types of resources, different types of resources. And uh, I would have and recommend that definitely this has to be market driven. The moment you start paying attention to subsidies or other mechanisms of financing, they distract you for the real, from the real opportunity and the real value of them. Great, thank you so much. And, and, and uh, Daphna, Daphna, can you tell us a little bit more about, is, do you think that the, the, the work culture will change? Oh yeah, uh, um, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure about that. Actually, uh, there, is, uh, there is a published uh, uh, research, very, um, very new research. Uh, I need to make sure about the, its sources, but it says that uh, many specialists and experts from the startups that have been laid off because they cost a lot of money uh, and startups could not hold them, could not keep them. So those people are now favoring the big companies. Uh, so they go to the big companies, which means that on the day after, when the startups would like to uh, bring back those experts, they, they will not be available anymore. So this is one thing that startups need to think about. I mean, when they lay off uh, those specialists because they don't have money, uh, so they need to understand that it's very, very risky for them. So this is one thing. Maybe they would have to outsource. Uh, maybe they would have to keep uh, a new model and to s stay with those experts that um, they're essential and they don't want to uh, lose them for the big companies. In terms of the big companies, there is a very interesting, I would say, capturing model or recruiting model. And we see also some uh, new startups that are um, making a kind of a market a place for those uh, encountering, temporarily encountering between the temporal unemployed people, the ones that have been laid off, for very uh, temporal projects and the big companies. So we see now that the big companies are trying to, um, to find, to scout for those uh, people, those employees that were in the SMEs, in the small and business, uh, small and medium sized businesses and startups, and to try to attract them. So this is the second thing that we see already, which means that the big companies would be much more experts and the small companies, including startups, will be um, deprived of specialties. Uh, we also see, of course, um, anything that has to do with the, with the remote work, I mean, with the flow of work, working from home. Um, this is something that is really destructive. And it's interesting because all of us 
uh, we have discussed that and we have um, uh, made so many models about that, uh, but we were so sure that it wouldn't happen eventually. I mean, uh, it will be very sporadically working from home one day per week or so forth. Now we are forced to work from home and it disrupted everything, it innovated everything. And now we see many, many startups that are engaged in many services and products and information and data that is trying to um, give some solutions and give some insights about how do you work from home and how do you maintain an organization, a business, a cohesiveness, a, a unity, a engagement. How do you do that when you are so distant from each other? The same goes with teachers. I mean, they're also employees. It's also, uh, you know, a working uh, method that should be, uh, is already and should be transformed as well. So we see so in, in anything that you touch, you see so many uh, effects of the crisis on the ways that people work, on the ways that people are engaged to work. There is also a fear, many people uh, fear from being unemployed, from losing their, um, uh, I mean, the, 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 the niche where they were. I see many startups in the tourism. Uh, they are desperate now. They are desperate. They don't know what to do. They're trying to pivot. They're trying to merge with some others. One of the startups that is a really smart startup of um, customizing um, uh, excursions to, uh, to, to several characteristics of the customers, including some AI and machine learning, something that is really smart. So uh, they pivoted into deliveries. They make some uh, concierge de deliveries because they have the platform and there's no tourism and we don't know when the tour tourism is coming back. So they had to switch. And what I heard from the, I mean, from the founders, um, that they okay they make a living now because they have uh, another source of financing the business but they are not happy anymore uh, they are not passionate anymore they are feeling so you need to take uh, also into consideration the psychological effects uh, we say resilience and resilience means that uh, we will need to work with people that are now um, this i mean uh, um, well they they, they fear yeah, they fear, uh, even if they're not unemployed and you need to uh, provide them uh, and to gain back their confidential uh, on their um, specialty and, and uh, implementing their vision. So yeah, we see so many aspects that we will have to take care of. Of course, and uh, thank you. So I was thinking, I was thinking, you were talking about methods, et cetera, and specifically then the entrepreneurial ecosystem or the entrepreneurial industry, if we should call it like that, we have always been like the underdog because uh, we, it, we work with uncertainty, we work with uh, unknowns, we work with a lot of risk, uh, it, it, uh, we have to take decisions with, with not a lot of information, so we're in a way accustomed to uh, uh, an everyday pandemic, right? Do you think in terms of, and, and, and from the academic part, do you think there's a new skill set that should be schools looking at to develop? Should be uh, there something new in the academic curriculum that should be considered? Should be a different methodology, methodology to teach entrepreneurship or you don't see major changes in this. Yeah, so um, I think that it's a very timely question. Um, what my, my last book, uh, I published it in uh, 2019, so last year. It's, it is on educating entrepreneurs. And this is a book that covers many methods of how to uh, educate entrepreneurially uh, people that uh, plan to be entrepreneurs or are already novice entrepreneurs and they, and they want to gain something. So um, I was looking back to my book and thought to myself, what from this book could be uh, kept? Uh, is there anything that we need to put aside because it's, it is no longer relevant? 
And do we need to emphasize or to uh, stress something uh, more than um, the, the, the pace that uh, uh, it is uh, already? And I figured out that one of the things that um, most of the research in terms of uh, both uh, pedagogy and, and uh, academic research, most of uh, researchers would say that the academia uh, is a bit, uh, I would say, legs behind uh, uh, when, when it has to do with um, providing the right skills to uh, startups and entrepreneurs. Because in the academia, we have a structured schedule, right? A structured agenda. We have uh, our assignments and we have the exams and we have the courses and everything. And the real life of the uh, entrepreneur is completely different. I mean, there's nothing is structured and nothing is uh, formal and the assignments that you planned this morning would not um, be relevant anymore uh, in the afternoon. So uh, when we try to um, provide our students with the capabilities and skills that are more related to the entrepreneurial and innovative um, uh, skill set or, or a mindset and so forth, um, we might confuse them. So now I think that all those, uh, all this confusion and all this uncertainty is so meaningful, is so robust, is so um, something so strong uh, that we will need to make some changes. Um, I think that, and actually I'm part of uh, a consortium that we are uh, working on uh, plans and programs and assignments on what to do in order to uh, equip our students with the right skills uh, for an uncertain uh, future that we don't know what uh, it will be. And one of the things that we um, really stress is the uh, acceleration and incubation programs. This should be um, developed. Uh, this should be uh, aside the, the academia. It should, of course, get information and research and data and insights from the academia and give back uh, their insights. But it should be something that is uh, independent and uh, a standalone and that um, is uh, embracing the ecosystem Attracting, attracting the ecosystem so that the student uh, and the, the founder and the entrepreneur would have more, uh, I would say, uh, or maybe the gap between uh, the learning, um, uh, achieve, I mean, the, the, the learnings, yes, and, and, the, uh, and the reality would be uh, reduced. So yeah, we will get, uh, I, get I guess, deeper into, um, anything that has to do with practice and with uh, being together, getting together with, uh, with the ecosystem. Great. Well, thank you so much. We, uh, uh, we, we think it's very interesting because we always look at, uh, we look at Israel as an example of best practice. And now that you're teaching in Canada, etc. Uh, do you think that, uh, do you think still uh, there's, a, there's a trait that you could share that uh, entrepreneurs, uh, Israeli entrepreneurs have, or, or you think as Rogelio that talent is talent nowhere, it doesn't matter where you are. Do you think, it, is, is that true or do you agree with that? Because how come Israel has unicorns and, ha and has companies in the stock exchange and how come in Mexico we still don't have startups that are there? What, what do you think we're lacking of? And, and Rogelio, obviously, you're open to the, to the discussion now. That's I think that, uh, if you, oh, okay. an entrepreneur that is uh, active in the Mexican environment, if you put him in Israel or in a successful entrepreneur that is in, in Mexico, if you put him in the ecosystem of Israel or the ecosystem of the U.S., He'll be a unicorn. <laughs> he would become a super he unicorn. Would become a unicorn. I mean, uh, uh, we live with. Uh, I, I received a, a message the other day of a. It, it, he was not a, a, an entrepreneur, a startup. Uh, he was a businessman of a, a small company, but but he said it's so hard to 
to, to launch a company and operate a company in, in countries like us, there's a lot of friction. What we need to focus ourselves is in, in really understanding, building a, a they're very, people very passionate with their heart and very intelligent with their minds, but uh, we need to help them build a, a community that supports them and, uh, and uh, basically help them thrive in, in what they do because uh, uh, entrepreneurs, do, they're experts at solving problems and getting around obstacles. You don't have to give them instructions. They will find out how to make it happen. <laughs> what do you think, Daphna? Is it, is, is, do you agree with that? Or do you think that Israel has a, a better structure? Or what do you think? You know, based on the book of Israel as a startup nation, so there are three, there are three causes, so three uh, yeah, journeys that uh, Israelis, Israeli entrepreneurs go through or are the sources for the robustness of the Israeli uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem. One is the military service that Ochalio has just uh, discussed. Uh, so most of the young people go to the military uh, yeah, and it gives resilience and it gives some, um, um, well, leadership skills uh, that are really needed in the entrepreneurial ecosystem as well and as a business leader as well. So this is one thing. The other thing, as we said, the, the, the geopolitical uh, uh, influences. And then there is another thing that is very interesting. I'm not sure if you are familiar with the kibbutz. Have you heard about the kibbutz? Yes, yes. The kibbutz is a, it's a community. Actually, it's a community. Everybody needs to be for the other, to contribute for the other, uh, to be tolerant, to be, to share. Um, everything is exposed. And I think that uh, growing with this type of culture and mindset, it's very important for an entrepreneur because uh, you understand that as an entrepreneur, you cannot be a solo entrepreneur. You need to have a team, you need to have a community. And this is the reason that in Israel, we have many communities, not only the, the kibbutz, but communities for entrepreneurs, communities for as an ecosystem, including virtual ecosystem. So everybody feels very uh, embraced and very, um, uh, hugged by other people. So, uh, and it, this gives you a sense of uh, competence. So you can, you can do things, you, you will not fail. There is someone close to you that will help you. Um, I completely th uh, agree, as I said with, um, with Rogelio, that there are people that are born to be very successful in, in entrepreneurship. Well, there are people that are born to be very successful in sports or in music or whatever. Yes, there are those talents, but I think that the uh, ecosystem and the environment and the push and pull factors are very, very important to maybe to tailor it a bit different, to adjust it, to enable uh, this person that has spoken to you this morning, uh, Rogelio, uh, that says that everything is very uh, difficult in Mexico, maybe in a different um, environment, this specific person would be very successful. So I think it's, it's an interaction between, it's a balance between the talent, the passion, the resilience, the team, the idea, of course, uh, and the environment. I agree. So we, it's, it's 151 uh, here, we're almost done. I, I, have, I, and I have a personal question for you, for you both. Uh, first, Rogelio, if you can answer this, and then obviously we will close with, with Daphna, and obviously if you have something more to say. You, you are a person that has completed the cycle, and when, why, what, what I mean when you completed the cycle is you have been an entrepreneur, you sold your company, then you have, be, you, you have become a, an investor, you have invested, uh, you are now participating in public policy. You are a promoter of entrepreneur. You have done almost everything. What, what doesn't let you sleep at night today? Well, uh, first of all, I'm, I haven't done everything. And uh, I, I just keep uh, putting myself in front of... Uh, opportunities where I can contribute. Uh, uh, 
uh, what keeps me up at, at night? I, I sleep very well. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I do a lot of exercise. So uh, I sleep like a baby. And I, I'm an early bird. I wake up very early in the mornings. Uh, but if I would say what is really important is that uh, I think that we need to to have a, a clear uh, sight in mind that everything that we do at the end has to help people become uh, free in many aspects of his individual of the person no? uh, people uh, if people have freedom of uh, thinking, freedom of uh, religion, freedom of uh, uh, profession, freedom of e economic freedom, that's also uh, uh, important. I think that uh, people in those conditions thrive. And, uh, and, and uh, I like to say, and I'll say it in Spanish, is that uh, cuando la gente brilla más, is when, when people really, you see the light in their eyes. And uh, today there is a lot of uh, division, suffering, uh, manipulation, uh, contention, uh, uh, and, and really, uh, instead of really serving a, a higher purpose, so that uh, in a way uh, individuals women and men with equal rights uh, can live in an environment that we respect and that uh, we take care of each other. And at the end, we, we learn to coexist, but this, at the same time, and I'm thinking about the right word, but it's a, it's a sense of realization that when people get to that state, uh, people are happy and uh, happy with what they are, with what they have, with what they do, with uh, how they relate to others. And, uh, and I think that that should be the state of the world. And, and, and as entrepreneurs, uh, because even though I manage and invest in, 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 in companies uh, through our funds uh, at Dallas Capital, I think that uh, at the end, what we want is to really help contribute a little bit more in alignment, in aligning our world and, and solving problems that are out there. And it's good that we can solve uh, mobility problems or, or uh, 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 identity problems or, or uh, I don't know, uh, many other situations. But I think that at the end what we have and this pandemic has shown us is that we're very fragile, uh, we're humans and we're imperfect. And that in this fragility, not only as individuals, but also as, as organizations in our companies or in our orga or institutions, institutions in our states, this simple, very small microorganism has shown us that nature wins and nature plays uh, states the, the rules of the game. So let's, let's focus more on, on, uh, on uh, unless we want to get on a, on a Falcon X and leave uh, to Mars, let's focus on solving uh, and, 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 and creating that better behavior, better environment for, for and behaviors of all people so that we can live uh, happily. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your insights. So, um, Daphna, please close uh, with your remarks. What's on top of your mind? Uh, do you sleep also well at night? <laughs> I sleep well at night. I also do exercise and jogging every day, 10, uh, 10, 10 kilometers I have around the house now. Uh, so yeah, I sleep well at night, but I'm also very concerned with uh, um, challenges like uh, the one that has been raised by Rogelio. Uh, and specifically, I'm uh, an advocate of um, attracting female uh, to the entrepreneurial uh, business, to the entrepreneurial ecosystem. We don't have much here in Israel and actually it's a worldwide, um, I would say, situation. 
uh, condition where we don't, you don't see uh, many female entrepreneurs uh, and the ones that are uh, coming to, uh, to, to this, uh, to this uh, I would say, sector of entrepreneurship. So uh, most of them would be uh, female-oriented entrepreneurs, which means that they will, uh, that they will um, embrace more the um, uh, fe feminine uh, uh, products and, 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 uh, and businesses and so forth, which are usually less uh, beneficial and profitable. So uh, one of the things that I'm really actively, I would say proactively, striving to do here in Israel is to attract more students from my classes, female students, to our incubator and to our accelerator. We see lots of dropouts of those female entrepreneurs from our incubator accelerator comparatively to uh, men. And we are trying to, um, and I actually developed a program to uh, sustain them, to, to enable them to sustain, to keep them uh, with us. Um, and this is something, uh, and anything that has to do with diversity is really very, um, this is something that is really very meaningful for me. Um, combining, uh, I mean, just generating a team that is diverse, that has lots of uh, insights and dreams and visions. And as I said before, uh, many languages and many um, cultures and many accents uh, Israelis and Jewish and Arabs and older people and younger people and female and men, this would be something that is coherent, this would be something that I'm dreaming of and I'm striving, I'm doing this, I'm trying to uh, put all my energies in order to make it happen. Thank you, thank you so much, I, 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 I agree with you, it's a very interesting topic. So. Uh, it's, it's two o'clock. I just want to really thank you. Thank you very much, especially you that uh, we, you're in a different uh, continent and uh, for sharing your time, sharing your insights. I really thank you, Rogelio, for letting us pick your brains and sharing your experience as a, 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 a tech demo of the very icon and leader. Thank you, Lafna. Thank you, Rogelio. I'm just closing a little bit with um, uh, an advertising uh, just to close. Uh, thank you so much. If you want to, um, if you want to uh, uh, write something in the satisfaction survey, we would appreciate that. And also to remind you, there's another webinar coming next and uh, on uh, June the 12th. Please, please assist. And um, for all of you, thank you so much. I know there were a lot of questions, but it's difficult to have a one hour with two great, great uh, representatives of, of the representatives of the uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem. So thank you again. Uh, my name is Luis Marquez, and um, I hope I hope uh, you continue your startups and working hard. Thank you again, both of you. Take care. Thank you. Well, welcome.